Uh, we are starting a new series, and anytime you see uh, dollar signs of piggy bank or anything having to do with money, you think, oh, well, then that has to do with, right, you want me to give some, right? Ah, not necessarily. And I know that uh, in that little video that we saw just earlier, a few moments ago, it talked about conversations maybe we didn't have. And uh, I would venture to say that there's probably a decent amount of us in this room that have had very deep, intense financial conversations that maybe we know a lot about finances. I have some good friends in this room, uh, some that are here, some that aren't here, that are advisors that uh, do very well in the area of finances and understand how to do very well in the area of finances. But here's the thing. This new series and its intent is about value. It's about what we value and how it impacts our lives. Money has a lot to do with it on the outward appearance, but for God, it has everything to do with our hearts. It's our faith, our belief and trust in him and also our idea of him as God over everything. It's about knowing that God wants to bless us. He genuinely wants us to be secure and enjoy life. We read that a couple weeks ago. Drink, eat, enjoy the fruits of your labor. He wants the absolute best for his kids. Anyone in here ever heard of a spoiled brat? Ooh, that's scary to say. It feels like a, a spoiled brat. Every time you hear that, it's like kind of like you think of this like wicked person saying it, you know. But every one of us has heard of a spoiled brat. And uh, I, I'm sure some of us probably know one. Maybe you've had one. Maybe you've been one. Uh, but uh, most of us probably don't feel spoiled, but we sure would love to be, right? Everyone loves to be spoiled here and there. The truth is, most if not all of us are pretty blessed. I'd say pretty fortunate to say the least. We're the 1%, even if just because you live in America. The 1%. Extremely blessed. But sometimes it don't feel that way. And most times it doesn't, and it doesn't matter how much you have because it's not about that. Maybe it's just me. But doesn't it seem like we always need just a bit more? It's like, ah, come on, all right. We got, that, we got that milestone or we got to that place. We've saved this. We've done this. We're here. Ah, let's go after this, right? Let's get to the next level. Well, let me read some statistics to you. In 2020, 35% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck worried about just paying the bills. You might say, okay, well, that was 2020. Okay, well, today, just four years later, it's over 60%. 30% say living comfortably is their biggest concern, their biggest worry, their most stressful area of life. 49% of us have given little to no thought about retirement. One in five people say that debt is their biggest point of stress. And almost two-thirds of our marriages start off with debt. And also, that same amount, right around 60%, don't want to discuss it because it causes stress to even think about. And that stress, where is it most visible? It starts in our homes. It starts in our personal lives. It's the number one fight in marriages and the second easiest way to end up in divorce. Finances, money, value. But hold on. Listen. Money is not the problem. We've all heard it said before in Timothy 6. It says, the love of money is the problem. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Loving means to take precedence. Loving means that it's the most important thing or something more important than something else. The question this morning is, how important is it? And is it more important than everything else? than some things, than the things that it should be or shouldn't be. Because if money is our security, if money is our future, if money is the most important thing in our lives, then God obviously cannot be. If something takes first place, then everything else takes second, third, fourth, and somewhere down the line. I, I, think, that, I think that we need to understand how important it is to God, though. That it's not just a, this isn't just a subject that God's like, ah, yeah, I mean, I'll talk about it here and there. He talked about money more than anything else in the Bible. 
more than anything, way more than anything. But he also wants us to see it from his perspective. He wants us to handle it from his perspective. He wants us to value it from his perspective. And to to know that, we have to know that he created us and set up everything for our good. Money is pretty amazing. It can do wonderful things. It has the power to trade for just about anything in this world. And if our heart is right and what we desire for the world around us, we get an inheritance far greater than any monetary value. What do we value most in our lives? Even if we don't think it's money, is how we treat money saying different about us to those around us? Before we jump into scripture, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, my prayer this morning is is that I know that none of us are here by accident, not by coincidence, Lord. You brought each and every one of us here. You have something for us. No matter where we're at in life, no matter if this subject is not for us, if we think that way, Lord, there's something in your word for each and every one of us, God. And there is something here today for each and every one of us. You brought us here on purpose, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord. I pray, God, that you minister to and bless each and every one of us this morning. But most of all, God, be blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, yesterday we had men's breakfast, and uh, Duke shared with us, Duke Windsor shared, and uh, he just happened to lean into the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And I thought, hmm, it's like God knows a few things. It's kind of funny because uh, we're going to open to Matthew 6, and uh, <laughs> I promise we didn't plan it that way. Um, it just happened that way. By the way, Matthew 6, this is, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus spoke to thousands on top of a mountain, of course, uh, but it's arguably the greatest collection of Jesus' teachings, and it's all in this message in the middle of Matthew. Duke said yesterday, if we just read the Sermon on the Mount every morning, and I think he challenged us to read it every morning for the month of February. He said, if you read it every morning for the month of February, I guarantee you there's no possible way that it won't transform you. You can't hear Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount every day and not get transformed by it. Now you've all been challenged, so I guess you're going to have to read it every day. (laughs) Anyhow, let me jump into it. Matthew chapter 6 goes like this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you put your efforts to is where your heart is. Obviously, we already know that. But seriously, whatever you put your efforts to Whatever you put your efforts in so that your future is secure and full of plenty and full of what, right? We put our efforts into things so that we can have security, so that we can have safety in the future, so that our future looks good. We can have extra. We're going to be okay. But the thing is, is that God says where your treasure is, where you put your efforts in, where you put your passions, your desires, that's where your heart will be also It's not just the, well, what comes from the heart comes out of the mouth. What comes out of the heart is what's eventually going to come. It's a principle that works both ways. What you let in is what will come out. What you let out is what's been brought in and what you've allowed in. The heart is truly the deepest thing that God's looking for. Let's continue. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I want to I share something with you. Where it says there that the light that comes in through our eyes, that, that that's the most important thing. I think, I think when, when we read that, it's very easy to just read over it and go, oh, of course, right? I mean, what, what, you're, what you're looking at, where, where your view is, all of that, right? That's the most important thing. Well, what, what, what's happening here in the Greek is, is that the actual best way to describe or interpret what Jesus is saying here is two words, healthy, unhealthy, generous, selfish. And you might say, oh, that's easy to kind of put that together. Ah, I see what you did there. No, but it's the truth. 
is that when Jesus is talking here, the Greek that is actually being said and what he's talking about when he's talking about the eyes, he's talking about being generous and being selfish, how we view the world around us, our perspective of value, our perspective of what we share, what we view, what we see, what we take in, and what we let out. Generosity brings light. An unhealthy, self-serving perspective only leads to complete darkness. And how great is that darkness? Jesus says there, let's continue. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And we've talked about this. The NIV is what we use normally on Sunday mornings. It's translated to money there. But in the original, it's mammon. And when you look up mammon and you look up the definition and where it comes from, mammon was prosperity. It was security, though. It was so that they could have what they needed and make sure they were never without. And it turned into, well, if we have what we need and never without, we probably should have some more, right? And we probably should get some more and some more and some more. And it was never enough because if our security is found in what the NIV translates to, money, then it's not found in God. Then our security is not found in him. It's found in what we have. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. And I'm going to keep reading. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Ooh, I don't like that. I hate hearing that. Whenever I hear that, I take it personal. It feels very offensive, you know? You have little faith. I'm like, no, he's not talking to me. Is he? I don't want to be thought of, I don't want to be thought of as someone with little faith. But here's the thing. It, we've looked at this before. Solomon's worth today would be about $2 trillion. That's the translation from what he had. His cattle, his assets, his gold, everything that he had would translate today to about $2 trillion. No question, the wealthiest man alive ever. Could we possibly find somebody else in history? I don't know. But so far from what we've found, Solomon is the wealthiest man ever. And Jesus made it a point here to say that even Solomon with everything he had, more than you will ever have, more than you could ever imagine, even everything that he had could not clothe himself the way God could, could not take care of himself the way God can. Look at what God has done with this beautiful earth. I mean, there might be a time you walk into somebody's house and go, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But just tell me, you think that that is as beautiful as the Grand Canyon? It might be for a moment. Yeah, I'm sure there's, there's moments you walk into something, you're like, oh, come on. This is my Niagara Falls. I mean, really, let's be honest, though, you know? I mean, anybody ever been to New Zealand? Sophie's family, they're all from New Zealand. That place is one of the most beautiful places on earth, and there's plenty more like that. God did all that. Even Solomon with arguably somewhere near $2 trillion in worth couldn't clothe himself the way God can. I want to finish it off. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Listen, this morning is not about saying that you can't have what you have. This morning is not about saying that you're not allowed to prosper. You're not allowed to have worth, to have value, to have monetary, economical, plenty. It's about how you look at it, how you view it, and where it's at in your life when it comes to value. That's what it's about. Solomon was the wealthiest man ever to live. That's the story we know. That's what we know. That's what history tells us. 
and he was God's best. You know what he asked God for? Wisdom. He didn't ask God for those riches. He didn't ask God for the kingdom. He didn't ask God for any of that. He asked God for wisdom. And God gave him everything and more. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. He's not saying, seek first the kingdom and I'll give you the things I think you deserve, okay? We'll just cut it off there. No, he's saying, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. Also, seek first in my mind. There's another way you can look at it. You see the word seek first. And I remember as a kid, when I was really little, we would sing the song, Seek ye first the kingdom. Probably Kim's the only one that knows it in here. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we used to, you know, we, we, would, we would sing this old song. And I remember when I was really little, I used to think it would say, See ye first, right? I thought it was, See first the kingdom of God. And I'm like, I can see first the kingdom of God, right? That'll be my first thing that I always think about. But when I found out it said seek, I was like, Okay, I guess that's fun. It makes more sense, right? But when we think about it today and we look at it, the whole Greek healthy, unhealthy thing got to me this week. Healthy, a healthy view is equal to a generous view. And an unhealthy view is equal to a selfish view, a view that says that I need, I need, I need. It's all about me. Everything I view in this world, everything I see in this world and everything I seek in this world is about me, is what about I can attain not about what I can do for the world around me. Because no matter what, even if you do have success, guess what you do? The more success you have, the more you try to find ways to give back, right? The more you try to find ways to say, well, what can I do with what I've been given or I've earned? Well, the truth is, is that God created all of this. He created you. He created me. He created this world. He gave us the creativity to develop, to build, to design, to invent so every bit of it is accounted to him. Every bit of it should go back to him. Seek first the kingdom of God. See first his kingdom. See him first. Let your view, let your perspective, let what you value be focused on God. Let that be the first thing. And you will have a healthy, generous lifestyle. My perspective is everything. The way I see things is where it starts. And guess what? It won't change until we begin to be honest. What we say we value and the way we spend are often at odds with one another. But to change it, we have to have an honest conversation about it. I'll tell you, I, I, I share a little bit about my kids, and as of lately, it's been our three-year-old. And uh, she is, um, I, I would like to think, you know, we have a, our family, we say, I love you. We try to be loving. We try to be very, I, I mean, there's a lot of conversation there. The kids were homeschooled for a couple years. So, I mean, in the middle of all the pan, we, we were like, we've lived together for the last probably 10 years, day in, day out. I don't leave for an office much. It's like kind of working through home. We worked from home for a while. There's a lot of it. So, all that to say, I feel like we got a decent, like, conversational family. But for some reason, what, what happens when you're not, when you don't say I love you a lot or when, you, when you're not uh, uh, affectionate or not conversational or everything? Usually it's like, okay, here, here, I'll give you this. Just, just, just take this and go, right? You'll be good. I'll buy you this. Or let's go buy you something. You can play with that for a little while. It'll be great. I got to admit, this is very common around our household. So when you have a three-year-old that is just going, 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 and she's always needing things and wanting things, a lot of times for me, it's easier to just go, okay, just, just give it to her. Get it for her. All right, fine, you know, and let it go. No, I, I think about that. I think about the honest conversation that I should have, but I can't have it with a three-year-old. But the problem is it's not her. Just because she wants things, just because she desires things, it's not about her side of the relationship, it's about mine. It's about mine as her father to lead her in the right way. I want to bless her. I, I want her to have everything. I want her to play and, and enjoy it. I want her to see a smile on her face all the time. I would give her everything in the world if I knew that it wouldn't make her a spoiled brat. Right? We, we love it. Now, we want them to learn. We want them to learn how to earn. And the, part of this whole conversation is a lot of times we don't have those conversations when we're little. We want them to learn all those things. But really, we would love for our kids to be blessed. We don't want them to be spoiled, though. God feels the very same way. 
spoiled brat is entitled. It's someone who says, it's mine. I get this. I want this. I need this. God says, hold on a second. Let's just take a perspective for a moment. You're the 1%. I'm not expecting all of you to give money to Africa or Haiti or South America. I'm not expecting everybody to fill all the needs of this world, but man, we could start to do something. Can't we just step out just a bit? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a process. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's always going to end up with surrender. It's always going to end up at a crossroads where we decide if we want to trust God and his word, his principles, his promises. Do we want to trust him? It all comes down to us allowing God to transform us in every way. Do you know what being transformed in him means for the rest of my life? Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. God told Peter, Peter, anybody know anything about the disciples? You know that Peter was probably the one that was like, (sighs) Judas was definitely the one who betrayed Jesus in a big way, but Peter was the one who was constantly doing something to frustrate Jesus, always doing something that was like, come on, man. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. You know why? Because Peter declared Jesus as Lord in that moment. Who am I? He says, you're Lord over everything, everything. I know that. I'm a, I'm a mistake waiting to happen. That's Peter right there. And I don't think I'm much different. Peter was a mistake waiting to happen, whether it was cutting a guard's ear off, whether it was saying, well, I don't know who Jesus is. Don't kill me. It didn't matter. Jesus Jesus knew that Peter was the one. He was the one that was always arguing with everybody. I mean, if you've watched The Chosen, you get this view of Peter, and you're kind of (laughs) like, he really is us, isn't he? But Jesus said to him, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the best part about the scriptures, it says, and the gates of hell will not prevail. How many of us are struggling in some way or another? doesn't matter where. What area of life is a tough area right now? What area are you dealing with? Maybe a bit of the gates of hell coming after you. A bit of the enemy really trying to stop you. A bit of just like, I don't know, man. I guess it's just karma. Mm, I beg to differ. The enemy is at every one of our families, every one of our homes, every one of us individually, every one of our lives. And Jesus says here, when you declare me as Lord, he says, you are Lord. That's who you are. Jesus, son of God, Lord over everything. He goes, hmm. and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That's what you get for it. Everything. Everything the enemy throws at me. Everything that comes my way, every trouble, every trial, and every attack will fall flat and have no victory over me, my family, and those I care about. It's already been promised. We just have to trust the process by putting the principles into practice. I know I say that pretty often. But listen, when we practice the principles, the process produces the promise. It's that easy. We practice what God puts in front of us, and that process of practicing what he's putting in front of us will produce every bit of God's promises, and the gates of hell will not prevail. What can we do practically? I'll tell you what, if you want to do something practical, if that's you, if you're the type of person that says, I like to do things practically to kind of get things in order, maybe see where my value is. Well, I'll tell you what, you can do this. Pull your spending together, whether you need a statement, accounts, or whatever. Maybe you're pretty regular with it, and you can look back at it and say, okay, I got it broken down into categories. Make a list of what values you see in your spending. Decide to invite God into having control and implement ways to invest in others. It's that simple. 
Take a look at it. Ask God, what can I do? What do I need to change? What do I need to strengthen? Where do I need to look at? Maybe change some perspectives even. Number three, implement ways to invest into others. We're all doing pretty good for others in some way or another. I know it. I believe it. I believe that we're a part of a pretty generous congregation, a pretty generous church, a pretty generous body. I know that many of you give outside these walls plenty to many organizations, to needs, to initiatives. And that's exactly it. That's what God's looking for. God's looking for us to open up and say, what I have is meant to bless those around me. Am I still going to be blessed through it? Absolutely. And you'll be blessed even more if you're a blessing with it. Isn't that funny? Make a list of what values you see in your spending. Decide to invite God into having control and implement ways to invest in others. I want to give you a prayer to recite based on Psalm 119, 33 through 40. We're going to put it up on the screens. If you want to take a picture of it, you can. If you want to. But it says this, teach me your ways and I will practice them. Tell me the truth and I'll believe it. Help me to walk in your wisdom. That's where fulfillment is found. Give me the ability to long for what's right. Help me not to fixate on what I want next. Remind me of your vision for my life and give me the courage to change. Focus me on your faithfulness. When you want to invite God into your spending or into what you value or what you want to look at in your life, this would be something. Look at Psalm chapter 119, verses 33 through 40, and that would be something you can dig into. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I, again, I thank you for each and every person in this room right now, God. I, I'm honored to be able to stand here and share your word, share my heart, Lord, and encourage those around me, God. But I, I'm so encouraged just to look out and see so many that do want to pursue you, do want to seek you first, and do want to put you first. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us, help us to make the right decisions, help us to have wisdom in all our decisions, God, and to point to you in everything that we do. God, I pray that you would bless each and every person here, each and every home represented, every family represented. But most of all, we pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.